The man who led the U.S. Special Operations Forces has got Osama bin Laden, the man who ran the task force that hunted down Saddam Hussein, and the man who said, if you want to change the world, make your bed. An American hero, a legendary Navy SEAL on his life in special operations. That's all tonight on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Admiral William McRaven served 37 years as a Navy SEAL. As a four-star admiral, his final assignment was as commander of all U.S. Special Ops Forces. Upon retirement from the Navy, he served as chancellor of the University of Texas. He's the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Make Your Bed. We interviewed him on that. And now he takes us inside his career as a Navy SEAL and Special Ops leader in his new book, Sea Stories, My Life in Special Operations. Welcome back, Admiral. Thanks, Jim. Great to be here. Good. Um, you survived Hell Week uh, in Bud's uh, SEALs training, so I'm going to start off with a couple of tough questions, if you don't mind. And um, first Not one... at all, Jim, but, but actually, before you start, if I can, I, I really do want to pass on my condolences to all those families that lost uh, loved ones in Virginia Beach. You know, I, I did a tour in Virginia Beach. And I've spent many, many uh, days and weeks and months there. It is a fabulous city. And I was just so heartbroken to hear about the uh, the tragedy yesterday. So if I could, I'd like to just kind of pass out my condolences to uh, to those that lost loved ones in that tragic shooting. All right. That's very nice. And unfortunately, these things keep, uh, keep seeming uh, to, pop, yeah. to, to pop up. All right. Let's get started. On um, First off, you're retired now. Um, are you still making your bed? <laughs> well, retired, uh, it may not be exactly the right word, but you bet. In fact, now I seem to have to make it uh, more than ever because my wife, uh, after the speech came out, she said, well, okay, big boy, it's all <laughs> yours now. Uh, so, yeah, I have to get up every morning and make it. I'm happy to do it. That only sounds fair, by the way, because she sounds like a hero in the book <laughs> she um, is. A- as well. And um, also, I make my bed because of this. So um, not the most fun thing in the world, is it? You know, but it gets you going in the morning. It and, sure does. Uh, you, you take a little pride in doing it. And it, uh, it gives you the inspiration to do another task and another. So I'm good with it. Okay. All right. I want to jump in here with a couple of tough ones. First off, I look at this as the best and the brightest meet the Middle East. I've interviewed you, General McChrystal. We've had a show on Petraeus. I've interviewed SEALs. The moral fitness, the impressiveness, the leadership, the flexibility, creative, counterinsurgency integrated special ops with the military forces, yet two little countries, Iran, uh, sorry, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, success has been elusive. There's been a lot of unintended uh, consequences. I interviewed Emma Skye a couple of weeks ago, who you probably know. And, know her well. Yeah, she's, very, she's great. And she calls um, ISIS the bastard child of the Iraq war. Some say we've handed Iraq to Iran. Iran is destabilizing Syria. Syria is destabilizing Europe, this was a lot tougher than we thought. Um, how, how do you explain it? What, do you, what are your thoughts on uh, as you look back? Yeah, I think, you know, we have to be careful about uh, looking back, I think, too early in the process. But having said that, uh, you know, when, when you're in the military, uh, you go places and, and candidly, you try not to analyze the policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I was asked, somebody asked me the other day and I said, look, you know, we go as long as it is a lawful order, uh, the military will do its job. And I think that's what's uh, vastly important for the American people. If the if the political leaders, if our national leadership says go to Iraq, go to Afghanistan, go to Somalia, go to the border. Mm -hmm. If that's what our national leadership tells us to do, then we have an obligation as military officers and enlisted men and women to do what the commander in chief asks us to do. Now, in retrospect, you know, when you're no longer in uniform, uh, you can certainly look back and say, was it the right decision? And certainly military leaders in uniform uh, have plenty of opportunity, particularly the senior leaders, to talk to the senior policymakers and kind of question the uh, efficacy of the decision. Uh, but at the end of the day, they either follow, uh, you know, the orders or they're, they're free to kind of throw their stars down and leave. Now, you know, in Iraq, I, I think I see, you know, frankly, more progress than I do in Afghanistan. I actually have some hope for Iraq. Uh, obviously, we had to go through, you know, not only the, uh, the troubles of the, the Iraq war, the difficulties there, but to your point uh, and in the sky's point about ISIS afterwards, having said that, you know, the Iraqis have have come to the fight in a way that has been encouraging, I think, uh, as you see how we have pushed uh, ISIS for the most part kind of out of Iraq. And we have we've crushed the caliphate in, in Syria. 
I think there is some good news on the front for Iraq. Now, uh, do we have to be worried about Iran and the Iranian proxies? Of course we do. Mm-hmm. Um, but Iraq is, I, again, I'm a little bit more optimistic about Iraq. Afghanistan, on the other hand, uh, I am concerned. And I'm mm-hmm. concerned because as we begin to broker uh, this uh, peace deal or withdrawal with the Taliban, uh, Bill McRaven's personal opinion is, you know, that deal won't be worth the paper that it's written on. Yeah. Uh, and as soon as we execute a pullout, uh, the Taliban will, will surge back and, and Afghanistan will go back to where they were, you know, pre-2001. Uh, and that concerns me. Now, it may, ta- may take a while, but we've made, we've made a lot of good strides in Afghanistan, and I would hate to see them lost by, by our, our departure and the, and the rise of the Taliban again. You know, you mentioned it might be too soon to look back. I, I've done shows and studied this a bit, that successful counterinsurgency takes at least nine years you think that the American people don't have the patience to see through a successful operation like that? Yeah, you know, I always hear this about, you know, the American people are tired of war, Mm -hmm. Uh, except the fact of the matter is, you know, it's the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and the great civilians that are really kind of out there fighting the war, and obviously their families that are sacrificing as a result of that. Mm -hmm. You know, most Americans I talk to today don't even know we're still in Afghanistan. Uh, They... They have little understanding of kind of what is happening uh, in terms of the military forward. You know, they're, they're, they're concerned about other things. And I'm not sure that's totally bad. I mean, it is, you know, we have become, uh, you know, the military serves the American people uh, and serves them well. And I think that's a good thing. But, but yeah, you know, we have to be careful about getting in these long wars. Uh, obviously, this is the longest war in American history. Uh, it has taken a lot of blood and treasure. And, uh, and and the American people do need to be concerned about that. All righty. Um, let me ask you this now. We switch a little bit. To be the commanding officer of the president of the United States, is moral fitness still relevant? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've said before, Jim, that I had an opportunity to work for uh, – President Bush 43, George W. Bush, and then, of course, I was one of uh, President Obama's commanders. Mm-hmm. And I didn't agree with every man on, on every issue. I, I didn't agree with a lot of the political decisions they made, but I found them both to be men of great uh, character and integrity. And, and you know, and they were, I knew they were doing the right thing. Uh, at least they felt they were doing the right thing for the country. And it is easy to follow a commander-in-chief when you – see up close and personal that kind of integrity. So I do think it's important for any leader, and and not just the commander-in-chief, but for anybody in the military, anybody in the corporate world, anybody in the academic world, anybody in the sports world. I think integrity and character uh, are key to success on so many fronts. Okay, now you've said on the current president that perhaps the greatest threat to democracy in my lifetime, and a good leader sets the example for others to follow. A good leader always puts the welfare of others before himself or herself. Your leadership, however, has shown little of these qualities. Through your actions, you have embarrassed us in the eyes of our children, humiliated humiliated us on the world stage, and worst of all, divided us as a nation. Um, Are you standing by that? And and did you get a lot of flack as a military guy for coming out like that? You know, one, I honestly hope the president does well. Uh, every American should want the president to mm-hmm. do well. And, and, you know, I actually think on some of the national security fronts, he has done fairly well. You know, when you take a look at the 2017 strike in Syria, mm-hmm. uh, when Assad used chemical weapons, I think that was the right thing to do. I actually think in spite of, uh, you know, the fact that we haven't made much progress, I think engaging with Kim Jong-un was the right thing to do. I think pressuring China is the right thing to do. I think, uh, you know, pressuring Maduro is the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. So I do think the president has done some things well on the national security front, but I am bothered by uh, you know what I see is uh, his attack on the institutions, whether that is the press uh, or the FBI or or the intelligence community. I think these things tend to undermine uh, the fabric of the important bureaucracy that allows our country to move forward, because the bureaucracies. And sometimes people look at that as a bad word, but it's actually a good word because a bureaucracy, when it is well run, serves the American people well. Presidents will come and go, but the institutions will survive them. And it's important that those institutions and the morale of the people in those institutions uh, remains high and that that they continue to do the great work they do for the American people. So, 
so that part uh, continues to concern me. All right, talking about survival, we're going to talk about surviving nail seed, uh, nail seals, buds trading next. You'll see the Business Talk with Jim Campbell over the Business Talk Radio Network, 350 stations around the country. You can go to biztalkradio.com, find the one closest to you, listen to our podcasts over the Internet, and we'll be right back with Admiral McRaven. He was a Navy SEAL for 37 years, Bill McRaven. Life is a daring adventure or nothing, Helen Keller, you quote her. Did you, do you have a compulsion to push the limits, or what, what, what drives you? <laughs> well, you know, I think some of this is in my DNA. As I mentioned in, in the book, Sea Stories, uh, which, which is not a, a political expose, by the way. I know we had some yes. great discussions on politics, but, but the, uh, the book, Sea Stories, is really, uh, again, about my life uh, in special operations, the 37 years. It covers the Bin Laden raid and the rescue of Captain Phillips. And the, uh, and the capture of Saddam Hussein. But what I hope people take away from it is the great men and women I had an opportunity to work with. And again, these adventures, uh, to your point, Jim, my father was a fighter pilot during World War II. He flew British Spitfires. The, the Brits loaned us Spitfires uh, so that we could take on the German Messerschmitt. And so he was a man of adventure. And, you know, when you are being raised around this kind of greatest generation and, you know, the, the men that uh, that he uh, hung around with they were all uh, men of daring do if you will so yeah when you raise that that away i think it gets in your blood and certainly uh, my father encouraged these adventures and and that just uh, kind of headed me in the direction of being a navy seal i think okay so um bud's uh, s training 155 guys started in your class 95 as it was called 33 survived um, I want you to take us through that little bit, and uh, I guess one of the core lessons you learned, which I thought was interesting, was what you call the next evolution, which is to break, uh, when you're under huge stress, to break things down as small as you can and only focus on that. Yeah, the, uh, so SEAL training, six months long, and, uh, and every day, just to give your audience a sense, you know, you get up at the crack of dawn, you do about a two hours of calisthenics, you get a short half an hour break, you come back, you do a, an open ocean swim for a couple miles, you come back from that, you run to chow. You come back from that, you do a four-mile soft sand run. Then you run to chow, you take a short break. Then you go do an obstacle course. Then you come back after that. And then you go do another couple hours of calisthenics. So this is wow. your, your day every single day. And the instructors, when I went through, were all Vietnam veterans. And they were pressuring you to quit because they wanted to find out who was going to be of strong mind and body that could you know, be one of their colleagues going into combat. But there were young men that came in, and if you started your day off with two hours of calisthenics and you began to look too far down the day and you said, oh, my gosh, after this I've got a, a you know, four-mile soft sand run and then an open ocean swim and then an option, then guys just couldn't get past you know, what they saw as too many challenges in the course of the day. Yeah. So one of the sayings when I went through SEAL training was take it one evolution or one event we were, fro- we were becoming frogmen, so we started off as tadpoles, and we evolved into frogmen. So each of the events was called an evolution. So if you broke it down, to your point, if you broke it down to each evolution, and you said, okay, I just got to make it past this one. Let, let me focus on this one. Let me make it past this one, and then I'll worry about the next one after that. And I will tell you, it was very helpful to break things down into little parts Focus on those little parts, get that done, and then worry about the next physical evolution next. And I think uh, people, as soon as five minutes into the first day in the book, you say, uh, quit. And you, you honestly get no sleep for six days? So what's called Hell Week. So in your first phase of training, uh, we had back uh, when I went through Class 95, they've shortened it a little bit since then. But it was six days, started Sunday evening and ended Saturday uh, afternoon. And, uh, and you basically went six days without any sleep. You were constantly cold, wet, and miserable. And, uh, and again, this was the real cauldron, if you will, for guys that just thought they wanted to be SEALs and guys that were going to be tough enough to be SEALs. Because uh, after six days of no sleep and constant movement, you had to actually cut your boots off your feet because your feet had swollen so bad. Your hands were swollen. Wow. Uh, you're rubbed raw from the sand and the salt water. Um, it's a miserable, miserable experience, but it is also one of those experiences in your life where, you know, further on in your life, you look back and when you're having a rough time, I would always say to myself, 
is it as bad as Hell Week? And if it wasn't as bad as Hell Week, then I knew I could keep going. Did you um, ever get close yourself to ring, ringing the bell, quitting? You know, I, I never did. Uh, I had some tough moments. I'll, I'll admit I had some tough moments. But, uh, but I was convinced when I went to SEAL training that they were going to have to kill me if they were going to get me to quit. <laughs> now, there are times when you think the instructors might do that. But, of course, they, <laughs> they, they're very professional. And you don't see, as a, as a trainee, you don't see everything that's going on kind of behind the curtain. Uh, you know, the instructors throw you in the cold water and you think they're going to leave you there for three days. Mm-hmm. In reality, they have a temperature gauge. They know exactly how cold the water is. They know exactly how long you can stay in there before you get hypothermia. They've got corpsmen and medics standing by to help. So, but as a trainee, you don't see that. All you see is some, you know, mean spirited instructor has thrown you in the water and he wants you to quit. Uh, so it, it is, uh, you know, you have to go in with the right attitude. And, and I think I had that right attitude, which was, no, no, they're going to have to carry me out of here on a stretcher if they want me to quit. Well, what ends up in your mind being the profile of the survivors? It's not necessarily the best swimmer in the history of mankind and things like that. What, what is it? Resilience? What, what is it? it? It is very, very simple. You just don't quit. You know, I, we've had guys that were world-class runners, world-class swimmers. Yeah. You know, you had these phenomenal bodybuilder guys when I first started that didn't even last a, a couple of days. <laughs> it really isn't, it has nothing to do with the color of your skin, you know, your background, your ethnicity, you know, whether you're really fast or a really great swimmer. Some of those, the fast swimmers and the fast runners, does that help? Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's what's in your heart. Are you tough enough to survive this? Because you don't have to be a physical giant in order to make it through SEAL training. You just have to persevere. You just have to say, when the times get tough, I'm not going to quit. And if you do that, you'll make it. I got kind of choked up at your uh, reading about your parachute uh, injury. Uh, but the interesting thing was that led you to the White House, which uh, puts you right in the, in, the, uh, in the heart of being able to build a kind of terrorism strategy. How did you get through that injury, and how did you do it without getting any morphine? <laughs> yeah, so, so in the book, uh, I talk about uh, parachute action I had when I was a Navy captain, so like an Army colonel. I was in charge of all the West Coast SEALs. But, you know, I'm quick to point out to audiences that it was a, a fairly traumatic, uh, you know, parachute incident. It, it broke my pelvis apart by about uh, five inches, ripped the muscles out of my uh, kind of fractured part of my back. But I tell you, relative to what I saw in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and the incredible uh, injuries that these young men and women had you know, from IED blasts, you know, my injury was just a scratch. But, but what I wanted people to take away from that story was all the people that came to help me. Uh, because after the injury, uh, I mean, I was laid up for a long time. I was in a hospital bed for a while. Then I got into a wheelchair and then onto crutches. And, you know, my wife had to be my nurse. Uh, colleagues came by to make sure that I was doing well. My admiral made sure that I stayed in the Navy. Um, so the, the moral of the story really is I don't care how big and strong and tough you are. Sooner or later, you're going to need some friends to help you through the challenging times in life. And I was fortunate to have a lot of them. As, and you far know as, the morphine, <laughs> as far as the morphine went, yeah. uh, I had read a spy novel years earlier about somebody that was in pain and was afraid to take the morphine, and, and that stuck in my mind for some reason when I was, uh, when I was in shock. I think you've got to be half crazy to be a SEAL. You know, um, the uh, th- part of this that I liked in this, too, is you know, the military has this image of being very bureaucratic, et cetera. But what you really pinpoint, too, is people get second chances, and you guys, you know, a little hide paperwork if necessary, but you give, you give folks second chances. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and, uh, and I tell the story about a, a boat accident I had uh, when I was a, a, uh, in charge of SEAL Team 3, and uh, the boat got flipped in a surf zone. It was a 33-foot boat and a 40-foot wave, and that's never a good uh, combination. And, uh, and I got tangled up underneath the boat, a uh, shot line around my neck, which is this nylon line. I'm, I'm thinking, well, this is how it's all going to end. I mean, I was convinced that after all these years, after you know, a lot of things that had happened, now I was going to die under this boat. And miraculously, I come out um, you know, back into the surf zone, but now I'm stuck in, a, in another set of very large waves. And two seals in a Zodiac uh, come screaming into the surf zone, 
uh, in very high waves. All they had on were shorts and a T-shirt and, uh, and grabbed me. I don't even have time to get pulled out of the, out of the water before the next wave comes crashing down. We, we barely make it out. Those two guys and two more SEALs who rescued some other guys in the surf zone received the Navy Marine Corps uh, medal, uh, which is the, the highest medal for valor in peacetime. And I tell this story because, obviously, I got a second chance. Hmm. But the story starts off at the beginning with a young man that I held accountable for uh, driving under the influence. Mm -hmm. And, of course, in the military, uh, if you're found guilty as an officer for DUI, your career is over. Well, I had the opportunity uh, after this boat accident to, to revisit and to, ha to have an opportunity to, to help that young man along. I did. He went on later to earn the Bronze Star and save some other people, giving them second chances. So, again, what I hope people take from that chapter is, you know, if you have the opportunity, you know, give somebody a second chance. Uh, you may be surprised where it takes them, and, uh, and, and everybody needs a second chance every once in a while. And I tell you, the people in this book are just unbelievable. I mean, there's a guy that lost both his legs and I think half of one arm, and all he's telling you is, my life's going to be great, and I want to get back with my guys. You know, can I still, can I still function? Uh, it's just, it's really mind-boggling. Coming next, the Ace of Spades and Neptune's Spear. We're back with Admiral Bill McRaven. He's got a new book out, Sea Stories, My Life in Special Operations. It's a great story, by the way. And uh, let's start off with, um, let's, get, let's get into the special ops in this segment, some of your missions. The Ace of Spades was, of course, Saddam Hussein. I did not realize that you were almost his prison guard uh, when, when he was caught. Uh, just tell us the story. So the, uh, in December of uh, 2003, uh, I had actually gone over to Iraq a couple months earlier. We had been chasing Saddam Hussein, and the Army Special Operations Unit uh, that worked for me, uh, led at the time by Lieutenant Colonel Bill Coulter, uh, was were the ones that, that actually found and, and captured Saddam uh, outside to Crit. And uh, yeah, as the story goes, uh, we had a we had a source that led us to Saddam, and of course they they pull open the spider hole, and you've probably seen the iconic photo of the the spider hole and, and Saddam is in there and he raises his hands and says, you know, I'm Saddam Hussein, the president of Iraq. I'm here to negotiate. And, and one of the army special operations soldiers says something to the effect of, well, president Bush sends his regards <laughs> and they, uh, they pull Saddam out of the hole and they bring him back to the headquarters where, where I'm, I'm located. And I held on to him for about the next uh, 30 days. And the one thing that I'm quick to point out in, uh, in this particular story is that when, uh, when Saddam arrived, he was pompous, he was arrogant, uh, you know, he still had all the kind of uh, what he felt, I guess, were the trappings of being the president of Iraq. But, of course, very quickly, uh, I made sure that nobody came to visit him. Uh, we kept him, you know, healthy and, uh, and, and well-fed and taken care of. But because nobody came to visit him, over the course of the next couple of days and a week or so, uh, you know, when he, when he no longer had his generals and he no longer had his palaces and he no longer had his handmaidens, he really just became a pathetic old man. And, uh, and you really began to see the character of the man come out. And I've told audiences, if you contrast that with a Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. who spent decades incarcerated, and yet because Nelson Mandela was this man of great character uh, and great integrity, he was able to survive this long incarceration you contrast that with Saddam Hussein, who was truly an evil, pathetic man, and he crumbled within days of, of being in, uh, incarcerated. I think it tells you a lot about, uh, about Saddam Hussein. And you never really engaged him, right? So what I made a point of, because, frankly, he wanted to engage. Every day I would go in to see him to make sure, again, that we were keeping him healthy. Uh, I had a, a guard and a, a doc or a corpsman in the room with him 24 hours a day. Um, but I would come in every day to talk to the, the guard and the, and the medic, but I would never address Saddam. And, and I could tell it was driving him crazy. Uh, and he asked through the interpreter one time, he said, how come, you know, El Jefe, how come the chief doesn't, doesn't talk to me? I had told the guys that were in the room, nobody talks to him. I do not want him engaging you. And, uh, and so 30 days goes by, and I finally did engage him. He didn't know it, but we were about to transfer him to the military police and then eventually to the Iraqis. And finally, the last day I went in and sat down and talked to him because he didn't have a, a clue what was going on around. Of course, the insurgency was starting to come up and a lot of his you know, citizens or a lot of the Iraqi citizens were dying. 
And, uh, and I approached him and said, look, you have an opportunity here to do something good for your country. Tell them to lay down their arms so we don't have to have any more bloodshed. I knew he wouldn't do it, but I figured it was worth a gamble. Uh, you know, he elected not to do that. And, uh, and that, at that point in time, I told him, well, then you will never see me again. And you could, you know, I could see it in his eyes. It was like, uh-oh, uh, what does this mean? Well, an hour later, we transferred him to the military police. I did never see him again. <laughs> and, uh, of course, a couple of years later, he was hung by the Iraqis. Um, but, you know, but it really, again, it showcased uh, the fact that uh, he was not a man of great strength or great character because as the days went on when he was incarcerated, he just showed his true character. I, I love the uh, story that uh, uh, you felt that he, you had to have his beard shaved so that he'd be so recognizable. <laughs> and General Sanchez, who was running the whole deal, says, are you allowed to do that? And you said, are you kidding? I have the authority to shoot him. Yeah, Rick Sanchez was great. I really enjoyed working for uh, for General Sanchez. Yeah, it was. Uh, I said, hey, you know, if he was a threat, we always had authority to, to shoot him. Uh, <laughs> and, it, you know, I said, we got authority to shave him because uh, we always have the authority to protect ourselves if, if somebody engages us. And, and of course, uh, on that, you know, I thought we would have somebody kind of helping Saddam shave himself. I stepped out to make some phone calls. I come back and Saddam's got a pair of scissors and he's just very casually cutting his beard off. <laughs> and I reached over and I... Yeah. I need those scissors back, please. Yeah. Thank you. He kind of gave me that look like, what? People told me to cut my beard off. Um, but it was, uh, so we did get him shaved up for, uh, and so the Iraqis had no doubt it was Saddam. All right. Neptune Spear, of course, is getting Osama bin Laden. And the logistics were unbelievable, 162 miles into Pakistan without getting uh, detected. I kept thinking of the Iran hostage crisis under President Carter. And um, how did you how did you how did you feel comfortable getting through all that? Well, we had done you know very very detailed planning, and of course the CIA was absolutely magnificent. I think this will go down as one of the great intelligence uh, operations in the history, certainly of the CIA, and I think uh, of intelligence agencies around the world. But what the CIA was also able to provide us, in addition to the National Security Agency and a lot of folks, was detailed intelligence on you know the Pakistanis' integrated air defenses and and where the threats would come from. So, you know, I knew that our path in would avoid radar, would be able to avoid some of their gun positions. Um, so I, I was pretty confident in the tactics of the mission. You know, flying 162 miles into Abbottabad, I knew if we could get the guys on the ground, the guys were going to be more than capable of doing their job. The one threat that we really had and one unknown was, was the building booby trapped. Yeah. Uh, we had seen it a lot in Iraq and Afghanistan where the operators would go into buildings and the, either the individual in there was wearing a suicide vest or the building itself was rigged with explosives. So we assumed that because bin Laden had been in there for, you know, five years or so that he had taken precautions and probably had booby trapped the doors or rigged the building. Um, and so, you know, these guys, when you think about the heroism, of getting on the helicopters, flying that distance, knowing the possibility of getting shot down this high. Then they get on the compound. They don't know what kind of uh, enemy posture is going to be on the compound. And I have to believe, and certainly after talking to some of them, I know this to be the case, that, of course, as they're making their way through the doors, they're wondering whether every door they touch or whether every place they step uh, is booby-trapped. Uh, because, again, we didn't, we didn't know that. As it turned out, of course, uh, they had they had a lot of their doors were barricaded uh, and locked, and the guys had to breach the doors, had to blow the doors down. Uh, but it turned out the the building was not barricaded, but the guys didn't know that going in. So they get in there, uh, get Bin Laden, uh, and I remember the call distinctly from the ground force commander when he said, "For God and country, Geronimo, Geronimo, Geronimo." And Geronimo, of course, was the the code word for uh, Bin Laden. Um, but again, you, you have to think back on not just the logistics, because there were a whole lot of moving parts uh, in terms of just getting the force from the United States to Afghanistan undetected, and then 162 miles into, uh, uh, into Pakistan, get the mission, 162 miles back. We had a refueling stop, uh, and everybody getting everybody back alive. Again, a great credit to the, the SEALs and the Night Stalkers who conducted the mission and, of course, to uh, the intelligence agencies that supported us. I, I thought, too, it went very well. The, this decision took months, and you would go back and forth with the National Security Council and President Obama, 
And um, the process worked very well, didn't it? The process worked extremely well. And I always tell folks, look, irrespective of your politics, uh, you would have been impressed to have been in that room. I think I was in six or seven meetings. And uh, the president always asked the right questions, the hard questions. The other members, uh, Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates and Abel Mullen and uh, Jim Clapper, the director of national intelligence, John Brennan was in the room. Uh, you know, there were there were some uh, vice president, obviously, there were some heated discussions, but there was never any rancor. I mean, this was about doing what was right for the country. And, uh, and and you could tell that was their objective. Never once did we talk about politics, although I knew that had to be discussed someplace. Because if this if this mission went south, the president had to know he could be like Jimmy Carter and be a one term president. Um, but that never came up in our discussion. This was about doing what was right for the American people. And um, and I will tell you, I thought the process worked extremely well. And I don't think people realize how much training uh, goes into into this stuff. When when that helicopter, uh, I don't know if, if it crashed or whatever went wrong and you're watching this on video, what's going through your mind? Well, we had actually, the helicopter pilot and I had actually discussed the possibility of the helicopter getting shot down because they were coming into the compound and they were at about eye level with the third floor of the the building bin Laden was on. And so we were concerned that maybe somebody from inside the building could fire a rocket propelled grenade or open up a small arms fire. Now we had snipers in the doors ready for that. But the pilot had told me, look, if I get shot, uh, as long as I'm not killed immediately, I will be able to land this helicopter in what we referred to as the animal pen, which was the, the kind of open space nearby. Well, as I'm watching this on the video screen, as the helicopter comes in, I see it, it starts to waffle and, and, and uh, starts to lose lift. As it turned out, what happened was the down blast from the propellers hit this 18-foot concrete wall. And, and the, the blast went up and created a vortex, like a vacuum, over the top of the helicopter because it was hitting the, the three-story building, hitting this 18-foot wall. It created this vacuum, which caused the helicopter to lose lift. Now, again, I didn't know that at the time. I just see the helicopter starting to waffle and lose lift and, and kind of spin out of control. But the helicopter pilot managed to maneuver it into the animal pen. It was a hard landing. Uh, but I, of course, I'm listening on the radio to the chatter from the guys on the ground. I knew pretty quickly they were okay. The second helicopter diverted to another landing place, and uh, and the SEALs just went on with Plan B. They knew how to flex in the middle of a of kind of a chaotic situation, and uh, they all got out of the helo from the animal pen, breached the doors, and continued to to flow into the the building. Of course, we had a backup helo because again, we anticipated something like this could happen. Uh, finish quickly this segment. I think it's uh, got to have a great story. The you guys bring the body back of Bin Laden, but you want to make sure it's him. Tell tell us the uh, President Obama's tape measure. Story. So the uh, the mission was uh, was finishing up, and the president now is on a video with me, and he he said, "Well, well, Bill, do you know for certain whether it's Bin Laden?" I said, "No, sir. I need to I need to go. You know, personally, I identify it." And the airfield was just a, a couple of minutes from my little command center there. So I drove over to the airfield. The SEALs were just landing. They bring the body bag off. We put the body bag you know, on the, the floor of the hangar. And I unzip the body bag. And he obviously doesn't look too good because uh, he's taken a couple of rounds. And the beard's a little bit shorter. But I'm pretty certain it's Bin Laden. But I knew Bin Laden was uh, about six foot four. So I see some young SEAL standing nearby. And I said, hey, son, how tall are you? He looks at me kind of funny, and he says, I'm sure I'm about six foot two. I said, good, come here, lie down. <laughs> so he said, I'm sorry, what? I said, I need you to lie down next to the remains. So he gives me this kind of quizzical look, but he, but he quickly figures out why I'm doing it. So he lies down next to the remains, and the remains are, you know, a couple inches uh, longer. So I didn't think much of it. I head back to my little command center, and I get back on the video with the president. I said, well, Mr. President, you know, we still need to do some DNA tests, but I'm pretty sure it's him. You know, it, it, it certainly looks like him. And I said, no, by the way. Uh, you know, I had a young seal that was six foot two lie down next to the remains, and the <laughs> remains were a little longer. Now, again, this had been a very serious night with serious implications and, and a lot of high anxiety. But at that moment, the president pauses and he says, OK, Bill, let me get this straight. <laughs> we had 60 million dollars for a helicopter and we didn't have 10 dollars for a tape measure. And, uh, and again, it was just kind of the right light moment in a night of, of kind of high anxiety that I thought was perfectly timed. Well, a couple of days later, I get back to the States. I have to go over to the Capitol Hill to testify. 
and I get the call that the president wants to wants to see me over in the Oval Office. So I went into the Oval Office, and, and along with me was my great Sergeant Major, uh, Command Sergeant Major Chris Ferris, my Executive Officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Art Sellers, and my aide, uh, Major Mike Alexander. And, uh, and, and while we're in there, the president says, Bill, I got something for you. <laughs> and he reaches behind the desk and hands me a plaque. And on the plaque says, you know, from the president of the United States uh, to Vice Admiral Bill McRaven, if we have $60 million for a helicopter, I think we can find $10 for a tape measure. And on the plaque, of course, is a tape measure. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I have that, ta- that tape measure plaque in my, in my study here at home. Final national segment coming right up. Former Commander, U.S. Special Operations Forces, Admiral William McRaven. Um, let me ask you this. I was kind of surprised by this number. You guys got 2,000 uh, high-value targets. Uh, you were doing 10 raids a night, thousands by the time you were done. That's incredibly impressive. But we lost 300 special ops. How, how, do you, how does that hit you? Yeah, you know, that, that is the toughest thing uh, about any time. I think you go in, into combat is the, the sacrifices of the men and women that you serve with. And, and I actually, I think I got the figure the other day, from 9-11 uh, until now, we lost 460 operators. Wow. But, of course, you know, that, uh, when you look at that, uh, we also lost thousands of great soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians that supported the war effort. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the men and women, you know, the, these great men and women raise their hand, they volunteer, uh, to go into this fight, and unfortunately, uh, sometimes the, the sacrifice is the ultimate sacrifice. Now, the 460 operators, these were across all special operations yeah. forces, certainly not just uh, the ones I had. Um, but, you know, you, you never forget uh, those, those times when you're having to stand in front of the family and, uh, you know, and, and pay your respects uh, for their sacrifice, for their, their fallen loved ones. It's a uh, it is very sobering, and it, it does make you think about the consequences of war. Organizationally, I think this was the first time that there had been a command over all the special ops forces and so well integrated into the military. Was that a big challenge? And there's rivalries, of course, between the services and the CIA, et cetera? Well, for the, uh, you know, when I was the U.S. Special Operations Commander, uh, you know, we had great relationships with the CIA and NSA. Now, again, there were always you know, some individuals that, uh, that didn't get along at the, uh, you know, at some of the operational levels. But in general, uh, you know, the special operations and all of the interagency have, have always had a, a great relationship. Um, and, and the thing I like about special operations, we are joint. So when you think about a service, you go back to 1987, the Goldwater Nichols Act. Mm-hmm. 1987 also created the U.S. Special Operations Command to oversee all of special operations, Army, Navy, Air Force, and then the Marine Corps, uh, which uh, was late in arriving to special operations. And now we have some great Marine Raiders. But all of these services really are what makes special operations special. A couple of years ago, somebody uh, talked to me about, uh, well, when I was a SOCOM commander, talked to me about making special operations a single service, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, special operations. And I said, not on your life. I said, I love the service cultures. Mm-hmm. A soldier brings a different culture than a sailor does than a Marine does, than an Airman does. And those are important cultures to bring into the mix of being a special operations force. So uh, I love the jointness of it. I love the interagency aspect of it. I wouldn't change a thing. Now, uh, I think you were the longest-serving uh, SEAL, 37 years, if I, if I got that right out of your book. What, um, what was it like to retire finally and um, uh, the biggest takeaway from your uh, career in the Navy? Yeah, so I was the bullfrog, we refer to it. Remember, we are frogmen. <laughs> so when you are the longest-serving SEAL on active duty, so I, in the history of the SEALs, I'm not the longest-serving guy in the history of the SEALs, but at the time, I was the longest-serving SEAL on active duty at 37 years. And, uh, and they give you this god-awful trophy that's got some toad <laughs> that sits on the top of it, uh, and it's pretty funny. In fact, I am looking at it as we speak, um, and it is the bullfrog uh, trophy. Um, but I will tell you my my takeaway, uh, after 37 years and having traveled to about 90 different countries, I tell folks, look, I have seen the worst of humanity. Uh, you know, I have seen what the Iraqis do in, in their torture houses. Uh, I have seen 
you know, what the Taliban do to village elders and to women and children. I mean, I have seen the worst of humanity. And yet, I will tell you that the good in this world far outweighs the evil. I mean, I have seen, you know, husbands, fathers, mothers, wives taking care of their kids, raising their kids, uh, teaching them to do the right thing. I have seen men in situations, men and women in situations that are where they are incredibly heroic, uh, taking care of other people. So, you know, what I hope people take away from the book is that in spite of, you know, all the chaos we see today in Washington, D.C., of all that's going on in the world, I have tremendous hope uh, for the future of this country uh, and really for the future of the world because I've been out there, I've seen the bad stuff, and the good stuff far outweighs the bad. I like the humility, too, that you said the, the, oh, there was always someone better than you. Um, did you, you're, you're a man of action and daring, adventure, and all. What, what, what do you do to keep that going when you get out of this? Well, you know, fortunately, I, I went on to be the chancellor of the University of Texas system. And, and really, it's not so much about the action as it is about having the opportunity to lead and manage and inspire young men and women. That's what I loved about being in the military, was spending time with the troops. When I became the chancellor, uh, while I, I kind of hesitated using the word sometime, the fact of the matter is there were 230,000 students across the University of Texas system. Wow. I viewed them as my troops. My responsibility was to take care of them, was to ensure they had the right resources to get through their classes, uh, to help the presidents of the institutions do what was right by them, to help the faculty. And so that same sense of, of service applied in my time as chancellor. Now that I, I stepped down from being chancellor last year, after three and a half years, I loved my time as the chancellor of the University of Texas system. And now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find other ways uh, to bide my time. But it is challenging, I'll be honest with you. You know, you miss being in the military. You miss being yeah. around the, the great soldiers. I miss being around the university system and the great students. But I'm sure there's something out there that will, uh, that will suit me when the time's right. Did you see a big difference in the academic culture versus the military culture? You know, I think what surprises people is, uh, from a leadership standpoint, no. When I transitioned uh, from the University of Texas to being the chancellor, people used to always ask me, well, you know, how was the transition? I mean, obviously, in the military, you just tell people what to do, and they yeah. do it. And I said, well, then you never spend a day in the military. Because in the military, you have to inspire people, you have to manage people, you have to, you know, encourage them by every once in a while, you kick them in the fourth point of contact, uh, you know, there are things you have to do in the military to get men and women to follow you, and hopefully it is by inspiring them. In, in the academic world, you have to do the same thing. As the chancellor, you have to inspire people. You have to encourage them. You have to lead them. Um, and, and so I didn't find, you know, leadership is one of those things that is fungible, that is transferable across, I think, academic, military, corporate, uh, and the military taught me how to be a leader, and that, and that served me well. I grew up kind of in the Vietnam era, so it's it's just really satisfying to see how well respected the military is and, and how outstanding the people are there, and um, you know how successful the missions are executed, even if the, you know even if they're 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 really really tough to win in the end. Uh, we seem to do the best you know possible job, and you guys at the top were were you know very, again people will say the military guys are inflexible, whatever. I find a very creative. Um, and brilliant, and w would have been expected to, uh, in my mind, achieve in the corporate world or the academic or, or whatever. As you, those, those skills look transferable to me. They, they absolutely are. And I tell folks going into the military, I said, you know, the military is going to teach you a lot of things. It's going to teach you a technical skill. It's going to teach you managerial skills. But the most important thing from the time you are a, you know, a private uh, or a seaman recruit, they're going to start to teach you leadership. And those leadership skills will help you wherever you go in life. And to your point about flexibility, I mean, you know, there's always these kind of, uh, you know, movie characterizations of, you know, the senior officers that, they, you know, they never listen to the troops and that they are, you know, Machiavellian in their approach or they're, you know, they're, they're not flexible. I found it entirely different. One, every senior officer knows you have to listen to the non-commissioned officers. You have to understand what the troops' concerns are. Because at the end of the day, your responsibility as an officer is to take care of the troops. It's to get the mission done and to take care of the troops. That doesn't mean you coddle them. That means you set a standard, that you give them the resources, and you hold them accountable when they don't achieve those standards. But at the end of the day, your job as an officer is to take care of the troops so that they can do the mission.
they're the ones that, that deserve the credit. Wow. Thanks to Bill McRaven. That book, again, is Sea Stories, My Life in Special Operations. Uh, it's great stories. Um, humble as well. This has been Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Thanks to Admiral McRaven. Thanks for his service, of course, to our nation. Thanks to our national audience for listening. We'll see everybody next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.